All right, welcome back to the channel. Today, I want to talk about the best fantasy landing spots for the rookie wide receivers in the 2024 NFL Draft and break them all down in as much detail as I can to give you my reasoning for this top five. We're going to go through a few honorable mentions, then we'll talk about the top five, both in redraft and in dynasty, because I think the two are going to be very different outlooks, particularly with Roma Dunze, who doesn't feature in my top five. So I will explain. I will get to it, all right? So have a little patience. Let's get comfortable. Let's talk about the rookies in the 2024 NFL draft, where each of them landed, which team they're playing on, which quarterback they're playing with, the offensive coordinator, and all of the things that I like or don't like about the guys that I'm going to talk about in today's video. So if you're new here, please do subscribe. If you like this kind of content, please hang around. We'll do loads more of this sort of stuff in the build up to the 2024 season. And if this is the sort of thing that you find enjoyable or that you find gives you some value, then please do drop a like on the video because we're really trying to figure out what the best angle for us with the channel is right now. So that would be super helpful for me to understand that from you guys. Anyway, let's get into a couple a couple of honorable mentions that I want to talk about in today's video before we get into the top five. So we're going to go through all of those. Brian Thomas is one of them. I do think there's going to be really good opportunity for Brian Thomas with the Jags. My concern with him is that he's kind of a, like, he's the long ball threat. He's the deep threat. He runs a lot of go routes and hitch routes. And I just think it's going to take time for him to develop in the NFL as a route runner. He has all the tools and the traits and the speed and all of the things that he needs to be a productive wide receiver in the NFL. And obviously the Jags just let Zay Jones go. So there is going to be an opportunity for Brian Thomas on that team. But Looking at it the way it sets up right now, I still feel like Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram are easily going to surpass him in targets and they have a very, very valuable receiving back in Travis Etienne with the Jags as well. So for me, Brian Thomas doesn't make the top five because he's going to be like option four at least, at least early on in his career with the Jags. So not in a rush to be putting him in the top five. And I will talk about Roma Dunze as well, but I'm going to do a couple of others first. So Xavier Worthy, I was very close to putting in the top five of my list. But the reason I didn't is, again, it's going to be so crowded with the Kansas City Chiefs. And as productive as Patrick Mahomes is, it's always been very, very difficult to try and guesstimate which wide receiver is going to be the one that has an extremely productive season or week to week. In best ball, I think Kansas City Chiefs receivers are amazing. In best ball, absolutely. But Week to week, you know, you've still got Sky Moore there. At the moment, Kadarius Tony is still there. We don't know what's going to happen with Rasheed Rice. Um, they added Marquise Hollywood-Brown, so he's going to be in there as well. That's already four names just at wide receiver. And of course, Travis Kelsey is al always going to be the primary target there until the day that he hangs up his cleats. So... I love Xavier Worthy. I think there's a lot to like about him. And I can't wait to watch him play with the Chiefs, but I just think it's too much of a risk right now to really prioritize him as a wide receiver in fantasy football, particularly in redraft. In dynasty, yes, absolutely. I think you you know, you know get a piece of Patrick Mahomes' future at wide receiver. That sounds great to me. I still wouldn't quite have him in the top five though. So Xavier Worthy is another one. And obviously there's a couple where the landing spot just really hurt them. Ricky Pearsall was one of those. Uh, Roman Wilson was another. I do really like Jalen Polk. Jalen Polk very narrowly missed out on my top five. I think there's a lot to like about him landing with Drake May coming in together um, and the potential for him to explode. But they also drafted Javon Baker and they have a couple of other pieces in New England right now. So going into year two, I think we could see Jalen and Polk's wide receiver value increase a lot. Uh, I'm just not ready to kind of take the leap on that right now. Malachi Corley's another one who kind of really saw his value dented by landing with the Jets, but it does sound like they have some big plans for him. So, you know, maybe Malachi Corley's a guy that we can talk about. Xavier Leggett just missed out and I think with that we can talk about Roma Dunze and then we'll get into my number five pick. So, I think, you know, on the surface, it's fairly obvious that Roma Dunze is not going to be a top two target for Caleb Williams coming out of the gate, you know, and it concerns me that they have two pass catching tight ends. Gerald Everett had 70 plus targets with the Chargers last year. Cole Komet is a good pass catching tight end as well. So they have two options at tight end and two primary wide receivers like DJ Moore and Keenan Allen. Those are volume receivers. They had something like 270 plus targets between them um, last season on their respective teams. Obviously, DJ Moore was playing in Chicago, but with Justin Fields, while Keenan Allen was playing with Justin Herbert and the Chargers. How that works between those two is already complicated enough but to add Roma Dunze into that conversation and try and figure that out as well 
as much as I love him as a top 10 prospect and someone who could be a really great long-term wide receiver in the NFL, first, he's got to beat out Keenan Allen. And, you know, Keenan Allen's into his 30s. Like he's, yes, at some point he will slow down, but he's not a speedster. He's a route technician. He's got elite level hands. He's a separator. And he can continue to do that in the NFL for at least another two or three seasons. So I'm just not prepared to go top five on Roma Dunze as it is right now. So with that in mind, Let's get into prospect number five. Okay, so at number five, I have Keon Coleman with the Buffalo Bills. Now, small caveat. I know that because of the personality stuff and the fact that since he's been drafted, he has been like the meme lord for the NFL. He's like, it's he's Taylor Swift levels. They are promoting everything they can about Keon Coleman. The Buffalo Bills are doing the same. He's doing his rounds on social media. He's been extremely popular. And some people believe that he is being overdrafted because of that. And I, again, I get that because the popularity since he was drafted in Buffalo has been absolutely wild. But... With that being said, you know, yes, there are elements of that that I think play into it. But for me, he is still a top five wide receiver. Now, my only concern is the narrative that surrounds him around a lack of separation. And that was something that played out on tape and was one of the reasons that he was not one of the top five wide receivers drafted. But for the Buffalo Bills, this is the guy that Josh Allen wanted. Josh Allen said, I wanted to play with Keon Coleman. Uh, from what we know, I want to play with Keon Coleman. And they went and they got Keon Coleman. And, you know, Stephon Diggs has left and vacated the number one spot. Gabe Davis has left. Josh Allen's going to have to find new targets in 2024. And if this is the guy that Josh Allen wanted as one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, then who am I to argue against that? You know, he personally vouched for Keon Coleman over other receivers. Yes, maybe not the top three, but this is the guy he wanted. So, I, you know, and some people are saying, I saw a tweet that said Keon Coleman's going to be Gabe Davis. He's not going to be Stephon Diggs. That may well be the case, but I am willing to take the risk on a guy like Keon Coleman over somebody like Xavier Worthy, who's playing in a really crowded locker room with Rasheed Rice and Sky Moore and Kadarius Toney and all the other guys that are in that Kansas City Chiefs offense where they don't really have a guy that is the guy that they go to behind Travis Kelsey. Sometimes it changes by game, you know, and obviously Marquise Brown in there as well now as the more experienced wide receiver. So I don't love that, but I don't think we should be skipping out on Keon Coleman out of fear. You know, I think I'm willing to take the bold approach here that like, what if he does end up as the wide receiver one with the Buffalo Bills and, you know, can put up 13, 1400 yards as a rookie. He could easily be one of the most productive wide receivers in this class in the first few years of his career. Why wouldn't he be? You know, that yes, they're probably going to lean into the run game a little bit more. That's kind of Joe Brady's philosophy, but the play action you know, being able to open things up and get Keon Coleman involved. And I just see a crystal clear path to 120 plus targets. And I think for me in Josh Allen's offense, I just don't want to, like, I would have to have that in my top five. So there is a clear path to targets. He's going to be playing with probably him and Dalton Kincaid as the primaries. Curtis Samuel will be in there somewhere as well. Um, and, you know, yeah, they're going to run the football, but like Josh Allen's still going to need a go-to guy. And if Keon Coleman ends up being that, you're just going to be so upset that you didn't draft him earlier, both in Dynasty and in Redraft. So, you know, I'll be interested to see, and I haven't looked yet, but I'll be interested to see where Keon Coleman is rated um, in ADP versus Curtis Samuel. Um, so that will be interesting to watch as we get kind of closer to the season, but no primary no primary wide receiver with the Buffalo Bills right now. It's there for the taking. So I am taking Keon Coleman at wide receiver number five from this rookie class. Now, my number four might surprise you a little bit, but I'm going with A.D. Mitchell in the Indianapolis Colts offense. And this is one that I, the more I look into it, the more I feel good about it. And some of this is me putting complete faith in Shane Steichen as one of the best young offensive play callers in the NFL. There are a couple of concerns here. Yeah, they have like more, you know, a quarterback that can run and that can take some targets away from the wide receivers. They have a good run game. You know, if Jonathan Taylor is back to his best this year, that could also be a factor in, you know, the decision to kind of, give more targets to Adonai Mitchell but I just a little like number three on this list and then we'll get to number three obviously as we do the countdown but the lack of 
complete realized potential in college because he's not had like a 1400 yard year um you know in either of the two offenses that he played in in college we don't yet know the potential for ad mitchell to kind of reach those heights in the nfl and i think that has some people running scared he's not going to be wide receiver one there of course not many from this class are going to go into that category there's only really two that you can guarantee that that will happen and keon coleman is arguably the third one but for ad mitchell he's going to be I think he should be wide receiver two to Michael Pittman Jr. And he lands with Shane Steichen and that is what is getting me to really lean into this. You know, you're going to get Anthony Richardson coming back healthy and that means Shane Steichen can run his offense exactly how he wants to, which should, in theory, emulate the Philadelphia Eagles 2022 offense. And when you look at the numbers from that offense... You should be looking at both of their primary wide receivers and maybe Josh Downs ends up being wide receiver too and Adonai Mitchell is the third option, but that's a risk I'm willing to take. So in 2022, Shane Steichen guided the Eagles and wait for this to almost 5,000 passing yards, not 4,000, 5,000 passing yards with AJ Brown and Devontae Smith combining for over 3,000 yards between them. That's amazing. Devontae Smith as the wide receiver two on that offense put up over 1,300 yards and there is zero reason that A.D. Mitchell can't be that guy in the Indianapolis Colts offense. I'm not saying he's Devontae Smith. I'm not saying he will be the receiver that Devontae Smith is in the NFL, but the path to potential volume and to big receiving yards, even as a wide receiver two, is there for him in a Shane Steichen offense. I just can't, I can't stress that enough. I really feel like going into this year, it will be between Mitchell and Josh Downs and I really liked Josh Downs as well he's currently on my taxi squad and I'm gonna have to pull him off this year in Dynasty but I think AD Mitchell's a great Dynasty pickup and I also think he could be a very valuable wide receiver to add in your redrafts league in your redraft leagues that might be overlooked a little bit later on in those drafts so Shane Steichen is a great play caller we saw that with the Eagles when he left the Eagles everything went south for that offense it's very clear that he is the mastermind behind that season that took them to the Super Bowl And the Colts are somewhat of a sleeper this year. The other thing that really sticks out to me is that even, you know, those two receivers in Philadelphia had 3,000 yards that year with Dallas Goddard also being a big primary target within the offense. He had like 75 plus targets himself. The Colts don't have that. The Colts don't have a tight end that will take those targets away. So it should spread between the three wide receivers. And I think we're going to see A.D. Mitchell get a lot more production than some people are thinking he might going into his rookie year. Now, at number three, and these two could have been interchangeable. I could even have put A.D. Mitchell a little bit higher, but I'm going with Lad McConkey from the L.A. Chargers, landing with Jim Harbour as one of the wide receivers who could easily be wide receiver one if that is the way that things turn out. I mean, like, yes, I'm fully aware that the Chargers are going to lean so far into being a run-heavy offense, Probably a lot of play action, setting up the setting up the pass, you know, in that way and opening the field up for Justin Herbert to throw down. Great. That's all good. And that would be great for Lad McConkey as well. I just think, you know, again, much like A.D. Mitchell, if he had had the numbers in college, he went to the senior bowl and destroyed all the DBs. And Daniel Jeremiah was talking about this during the Super during the Super Bowl, during the NFL draft, and saying like Every piece of tape he did against like the SEC corners, your Terry and Arnold's and Kool-Aid McKinstry's, everyone was great until they played against Lad McConkey. He is an elite level separator, which is everything that Quinton Johnston struggled to be last year playing with Justin Herbert. And because of that, I just I could really see that Lad McConkey is going to emerge as the number one target for Justin Herbert, even if it's a run heavy offense, he could he could get the targets, you know, so when I did my research on this for the Chargers, they have vacated over 300 targets from the 2023 season, 300 targets, that's Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, who obviously got hurt and didn't end up playing much of the season, but still had like 30 targets early in the year. Gerald Everett and Austin Eckler as well. There were 70 targets for the running back out of the backfield last year. We don't know that Jim Harbaugh is going to do that this year. So the targets are there for the taking for these wide receivers. And Lad McConkey will come in as a rookie, as a more profound route runner and separator than Quinton Johnston is even in year two. So Lad McConkey is better developed to be an NFL wide receiver. And all right, they signed DJ Chark to a one-year contract, but 
Lad McConkey is the guy that Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbour wanted. This is the guy that they drafted. You know, Quinton Johnston's in that sticky position now where he belongs to the previous regime. He was not drafted by the GM that runs the, the roster now. He was not drafted by the head coach that runs the team now. And he's going to have to work really hard to prove himself all over again and try and earn targets. So they're almost coming in in parallel. And I just think Lad McConkey wins, you know. So, like I said, if he'd put up 1,200 yards in college, we'd probably be talking about him going a little higher in the draft for one and also being far more of a valuable option in fantasy football because people will have seen that he'd proved himself in college. And I think people will go and look at the college numbers and be put off, but the separation, the ability to destroy guys at the senior bowl. And just like, th there's so much opportunity here for Lad McConkey. And I think he's going to be far more productive than a lot of people think that he might be as an NFL receiver. And if you need an example, just go and watch the Florida game from 2023. It was his best game of the season. He was all over the field. They couldn't tackle him. Like just go watch that game if you need to see what he's capable of. All right, so with those guys out of the way and Roma Dunze not making the top five, there's only two guys left and it's between Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors, both of which, and these two are the only two in this year's draft with a clear path to being wide receiver one in week one of the 2024 NFL season. As rookies, both of these guys are going to come out and be the number one target it's just how you weigh them up and the situations that they're in with the offense that they find themselves in. So how do you guys rank them? Do you have Neighbors at one or Marvin Harrison Jr. at one? The two are far closer as NFL prospects than I think some people think they might be. Malik Neighbors surged into that conversation in 2023. He wasn't a big name really going into the 2023 season. And then he was so unbelievably productive. Yards after catch, led all of college football in total yardage, like 14 touchdowns on the season, the highest scoring offense in college football. And now he lands with the New York Giants. So I will get to Malik Neighbors, but my number two is Marvin Harrison Jr. So let's be real, wherever Marvin Harrison Jr. landed, he was going to be a primary target, but he's absolutely wide receiver one with the Arizona Cardinals. They have vacated spots for DeAndre Hopkins and Marquise Brown over the last couple of seasons. Even Rondell Moore's not there anymore. So Marvin Harrison Jr. is absolutely going to be the number one target at wide receiver for the Arizona Cardinals. Now, I love Drew Petzing, but he's he learned a lot of the stuff that he knows in Cleveland running that offense that was Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. And I really think that's going to be the way it goes this year in Arizona between James Conner, who had a career year under Petsing last year, and Trey Benson, who they drafted in the third round. I think we're going to see those running backs get a ton of work and it will be run game first, a bit like the Chargers, run game first to open stuff up for the wide receivers, including Marvin Harrison Jr. Now, He's the best route runner in the class. He's going to be a great separator. He's six foot four. He's almost impossible to cover. The production's absolutely going to be there. It just comes down to whether you think that Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. will be able to produce more right out of the gate. Now, long term, which one would you go for in Dynasty? That I haven't made my mind up on just yet, but I think for at least the 2024 season, I just think Malik Neighbors is going to be better as a rookie, because it's, and, and again, we'll come on to that. I don't want to give all my secrets away on the Malik Neighbors decision just yet, but I do think it's a great landing spot for Marvin Harrison Jr. And of course for Kyler Murray, but I think it's an even better position to be in for those Cardinals running backs. I think we'll see a lot from James Conner. I think Drew Benson is going to be very underrated all the way through to the season this year. I think he's going to get a very close 1B role, almost splitting 50-50 carries with James Conner. Um, and then obviously you've got the Trey, Trey McBride situation as well. Like Trey McBride emerged as one of the best young tight ends in the NFL towards the second half of the season. Um, and the production was huge. Like he had a big year last year. He was productive all the way down the stretch. Um, and it's then it comes down to what we expect from Kyler Murray. Like Kyler Murray, we want that 2020 season. That's what I'm looking for. The 2020 season that Kyler Murray had with DeAndre Hopkins, where D-Hop had over 1,400 yards that season on 150 plus targets even with Christian Kirk as a very solid wide receiver too. And I would argue that the Cardinals don't have that this season. It's probably going to be Trey McBride. He will be the number two target and he'll probably be around that 70, 80 targets range. But Marvin Harrison Jr., we want him to be in that 2020 D-hop camp where it's 150 plus targets. Kyler Murray is going to him in the red zone. He's trying to find him all the time. And that will mean big production for Marvin Harrison Jr. And if he is in that category or, if, or anywhere close to that category of the 150 plus targets that Deontay Andre Hopkins had that year, he might be the number one wide receiver in this class. I'm not arguing against that. You know, him and Malik Neighbors for me are a very, very close 
one A, one B, and it's just about which way you kind of lean on that. So with that being said, I have Marvin Harrison Jr. at two, and I will explain why I've got Malik Neighbors as the number one. Okay, so the reason I've got Malik Neighbors at number one is largely because of the reputation of the coaching staff and the team that he's landing on and the potential for him to have the number one targets in the New York Giants offense. Now, I get it. It's the New York Giants. They have been dreadful for the last several seasons. You know, they've not had a thousand yard receiver since 2018. I talked about that in a short that I recorded this week. Couldn't quite believe that Odell Beckham Jr. is the last wide receiver to reach a thousand yards for the New York Giants. That is shocking. They hired Carmen Bricolo, the former offensive line coach from the Las Vegas Vegas Raiders who helped to turn that offensive line around in the past two seasons and he's now going to inherit all that blue chip talent that the Giants have drafted on their offensive line and try and get them to figure it out so that they can give Daniel Jones a year to prove himself in what is effectively a year that he's playing for his life in the NFL. So a lot of it sits on the offensive line and a lot of it sits on Daniel Jones but there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that Malik Neighbors is going to get 130, 140 targets in that offense. Now Stephon Diggs had the most productive year of his NFL career playing in a Brian Daybol offense. And I get it. You know, Daniel Jones is not Josh Allen. I totally understand that, but he will be able to find Malik Neighbors for a lot of targets early in his career. And I do think he's absolutely going to be the number one target. You know, they're they're not exactly the same type of player, Neighbors and Stephon Diggs, but Daybo is loved by offensive players for his ability to get the absolute best from them. Now, Yes, in New York, they've not really had anything more than Darius Slayton, and he's not managed to get more than 800 yards out of any of his receivers, but he's not had a receiver to work with like Malik Neighbors, and now he gets this top five talent who he can go out get targets, get involved in the offense, build an offense around. And I just think like, you know, the Giants are crying out for a 1200 plus yard receiver, no primary tight end to truly take targets away from neighbors. I think Trey McBride is more of a threat to Marvin Harrison Jr. than Darren Waller is to uh, Malik Neighbors in New York. And that's, you know, Darren Waller has really struggled with his health. I don't think he's going to be healthy all season. They did draft a tight end in Theo Johnson, who, you know, might be a, a potential backup there. They've got Daniel Bellinger as well, but these tight ends are not as much of a threat to me as Trey McBride is right now. He's really this like ascending tight end. He's going to be a great player in the NFL, whereas Darren Waller's kind of on the other end of things. So that doesn't really worry me all that much. Waller had 52 targets in 2023. Trey McBride had 81, even though he didn't break out until week six. So yeah, Darren Waller missed a few weeks with injury. Trey McBride didn't really feature for the first few weeks. So you could probably kind of balance that out. And like I mentioned, Daniel Jones is playing for his career this year. He has has to prove something to both those in the building, Joe Schoen and Brian Dayball with the New York Giants and around the league. Because even if he plays semi-decently this year and the Giants still decide to draft somebody or pay somebody in free agency or move on, he might get a job with another team where he could potentially earn the starting role. Kind of like a Gardner Minshew type thing where he goes to another team as maybe a bridge quarterback. So I, I just, it, my gut feel is that Malik Neighbors will have more production in 2024. Which of the two of them will be the better receiver long term? I don't know. We'll probably be comparing them for a very, very long time, but I'm very excited to see what they produce. Now, might be a slightly different top five list to maybe some other people's, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't look at anybody else's until I'd done my research and made my own decisions. So you guys let me know in the comments what you think about this top five list. If you have an idea for the next top five list, you can drop that in the comments down below as well. I would love the feedback on this type of content, whether you enjoyed it, what sort of thing you would look forward to in the future from a channel like this. Uh, and I would happily jump on that for you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for making it to the end of the video if you're seeing this and I will see you guys in the next one.